Funding for the STOLA Report is made possible by a grant from the First American Title Insurance Company of New York. The First American Corporation is the nation's leading diversified provider of business information products and services that impact the major events of people's lives. Good evening. My name is Michael Stoller. I'm the host of the Stoller Report, Real Estate Trends in the Tri-State Region. The topic of today's program is the state of commercial office marketplace industry leaders' perspective. My guests include Woody Heller, Executive Managing Director, Group Head of the Capital Transactions Division of Studley, uh, Gentry Ashley Hoyt, um, Managing Director of the Shorenstein Company. Shobi Khan, Senior Vice President Investments with Equity Office um, Properties Investments. David Greenbaum, President of Vernado Office, a uh, division of Vernado Realty Trust. Stephen Wexler, a Senior Managing Director, Head of Global Acquisitions for Tishman Spire Properties. And last but not least, Eric Hadar, President of Allied Partners. In 1934, uh, an individual from Germantown, Pennsylvania, created a, uh, a board game by the name of Monopoly. Uh, the idea of the game is that you're supposed to buy properties, invest in properties, and people are supposed to pay rent. Uh, an individual can also, uh, if they buy a couple of properties, like a REIT, uh, they can have a monopoly. And if they have this monopoly, then they can put up a hotel. Unfortunately, certain people who are paying rent sometimes go bankrupt. The real estate trade, the capital markets, and what's happening in New York is like monopoly because many of the people sitting here have bought, have sold, have traded. Last year, a building uh, called the GM Building was acquired for one point, a, a mere $1.4 billion. Um, and what was more interesting is that the people who bought the building only put in $50 million as an investment. Uh, that was the highest price per square foot in a building. This year, Shobi Khan and his company, uh, Equity Office, bought the retail component of uh, 717 uh, Fifth Avenue, uh, previously known as the um, the Corning uh, Glass Building, $424 a foot for the office space, and then there was a retail component. Are the prices crazy? Uh, have we seen a, uh, a, a change? What's happening in this market? Woody? I love a general question. <laughs> What's happening? Well, let's see. Cap rates have gone down. Cap rates are the return you get when you buy something. So if a property makes $10 and you pay 100 you have a 10% cap rate. So the return that investors are willing to tolerate or accept has gone down for a variety of reasons, one of which is that the cost they have to pay to borrow money or interest rates has been reduced, so they can tolerate a lower return predicated upon the fact that their cost to borrow money to buy the building is less. In addition to that, there are more types of buyers in the market than we've seen for a long time. And so the competition to buy buildings has increased because the supply and demand is out of balance relative to historical levels. So the pressure of a lot of people trying to buy a fairly finite number of buildings has caused prices to go up, and buyers are able to tolerate these lower returns because interest rates are lower. So I think in its simplest form, that's what's going on, and then we can talk about the detail as to why. Okay. David, for a Vernado and equity office or REITs, you have to report your numbers to the shareholders. This year, REITs uh, have outperformed them. I mean, the market has been flat. I think REITs have gone up 26% on the prices in the market. Uh, how can you buy a building today if you're buying, you're buying buildings, and show a return, which is significant if certain people out there 
you know, the, these new players, these individuals who were written up in an article in Crane, these new kids on the block are buying things at crazy prices. Uh, it's obviously just a question of what returns one seeks to achieve. I mean, just in responding to Woody, as you kind of look back over a long cycle, uh, since 1981, 1982, interest rates have been declining. Uh, we are at cyclical, cyclical lows. Uh, how long that's going to continue for, I think, you know, we can all guess on this panel, and I think we all recognize that interest rates will have, over time, potentially a significant impact on the pricing of real estate. Um, real estate is an asset class, and ultimately, investors make decisions to buy real estate, to buy stocks, to buy dot-com companies, or to buy any asset class. Um, so I've successfully avoided answering the question you asked, which I've even forgotten at this point. <laughs> <laughs> you know, per per perhaps, you know, we'll take someone who might answer a question. <laughs> you, 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 know, you, you, you know what happens when, when you have people who work for entities, okay, Equity Office for our audience <coughs> is the largest owner of office properties in the United States. Correct. Uh, and, you know, Vornado, you know, people wouldn't know, you know, Vornado was a fan. Uh, started uh, 35 years ago, but Vornado just built this very small tower uh, at 731 uh, Lexington Avenue, and, and they have a tenant, I, I think he's a, a, f a government official is named after him, uh, where Mr. Bloomberg, uh, Bloomberg LLP is the main tenant, and Mr. Greenbaum would not say, but they are in negotiations to rent the balance of the space to another tenant. Uh, but, you know, there are there are people over here like uh, Mr. Wexler, uh, who uh, you know has some other properties, you know, something called uh, I think Rockefeller Center, uh, and um, you know then there's this property called the Chrysler Center. And since you are the director of global acquisitions and you've been involved and you've been with them since you uh, for, for you started high with school. Tishman. No, it was nice. I read the resume. I went to the website. You know, you've been there since the, you know, uh, since the creation. Um, you guys have well have repositioned properties. Mm -hmm. My my big question today is that the you know the market is cyclical, uh, and and you've seen this in your careers. You know, one time you even practiced law. Uh, you know, uh, this changing things happen, and. Everybody remembers the boom. 1999, everything was doing great. The, the intercom things, everything was doing great. 2000, the world changed. 2001, we had the tragic events of 9-11. We lost 10 million square feet of space. Where was it absorbed? You're in the leasing business. Tell me where it was absorbed. Don't be evasive on this question. Where was the space absorbed? <laughs> what was pretty fascinating was right after 9-11, um, the expectation was that uh, with the loss of this 10 million feet, literally we would go down to a 0% vacancy rate. And what's pretty fascinating about what happened, I think what it really did, is many of the companies that were looking to dispose of space at the time, actually the event, in a sense, enabled many of these companies to dispose of space. A lot of dot-coms that were in deep, deep trouble at the time were able to dispose of their space as tenants that were migrating from the disaster downtown came uptown. Um, so instead of ending up with a 0% vacancy rate, what realistically happened at that point in time is we ended up going from a vacancy rate at that time, call it 5, 6, 7%, and trending upwards to probably 10% over a period of time. Now, you know, that happened not immediately. There was this huge rush to rent space initially. But again, what really happened, as you kind of parse through it, is a lot of the big companies, the Morgan Stanley's of the world, what did they end up doing? Shedding a lot of space. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the well, dot-coms... And, and where'd they go? They were long on space at the time. I think what happened in, in that time period, for the tech period, is you had a lot of companies just given the frenzy of the market that overleased their space requirements. So given that the vacancies were trending down low, they said, hey, now's my opportunity, we've got to lease more space. So if we needed 100,000, let's lease 150,000 square feet to make sure that we don't run out of space. And to David's point, that when 9-11 came, they said, hey, let's rationalize our space. We only need 100. Put that 50 back on the market. But, you know, I, I'd like to open this question to, to the group. Uh, there are, I think Shobi made this comment, and, and we can 
Two weeks ago, Shelby was at a program called the Real, Sh Real Share uh, New York, and he said that certain individuals are, uh, are buying property without looking at the financial statistics, putting down non-refundable deposits, and, and buying, buying these deals without, and the economics don't make sense. Well, I think, just to make sure, I think I said in this environment, with, given what we've talked about with interest rates, the debt money is there before the equity money. So you've got a lot of lenders that are willing to put out this kind of money, and the equity guys, if they can get 80, 90, 95 percent financing, they're saying, hey, what's the risk of me putting down 5 percent, getting my money back in a couple of years if interest rates uh, stay low? And I've got an option at that property in two years to see if I want to keep going or give it back. So you're seeing a lot of, in this environment, a lot of private individuals that are coming and folks that are using cheap capital to lever up and, and buy aggressively. Speaking of private individuals who are coming, you have Eric. You've been in the market uh, a number of years. Uh, and you recently, this year, uh, purchased 95 Wall Street. Right. Why'd you go down to downtown? I mean, prior to the show, we were talking to the guests about Lower Manhattan and other areas. What, what do you see about Lower Manhattan? Well, I mean, I think there's always been sort of two major categories of opportunity in real estate. One has been the opportunistic value-added opportunity segment where you can come in, think of something creative that maybe others haven't, and, uh, you know, institute a redevelopment plan and actually realize a which, significant... Which, you know, in many aspects, you know, look at the redevelopment uh, that Steve and Tishman did at Rock Center. Absolutely. The redevelopment at 666... Uh, Fifth Fair. Avenue, I mean, you, you took proper, sure. and the Chrysler Center, I mean, I think if you take those three, the, the two of them the majors, you, you change the redevelopment, but everybody's looking for value added. Sure. I mean, the essence of our industry is really it's a recycling business. We take assets that may be... Uh, and we play Monopoly. We, we trade. We trade and we take assets that were appropriate for a specific market and we try to adaptively reposition them to the, you know, the current day uh, demand. The other type of, of opportunity, though, that we're seeing are the opportunities that uh, Shobi mentioned, which are, in effect, options where you can get 85, 90, 95 percent, 98 percent leverage and, would, and, and cash flows. You know, that for, for our viewers, yes, 95 percent leverage means on a $100 million deal, somebody just puts 5 percent, $5 million. Two, three, four, five in that range. And if you take a deal that has 5% uh, interest rate on the, on the debt, often, you know, you can get out, meaning you can get a return of the 2 to 5% cash that you put down over the term of the initial loan, which could be three years, four years. So in effect, you've got an option. Uh, and you can then at that point, with no investment, analyze whether it makes sense to continue to own the asset or not. And I think there's a lot of people in this market that are playing that game uh, and playing it at least so far successfully as LIBOR and, sh and floating rate debt has stayed cheap. That game has been uh, <coughs> still available to people. And I, and I think that debt has been the great equalizer and it's one of the reasons that we've seen prices go up high and there be so many bidders and so many buyers in the market these days. How many, how many bidders? You know, you read in the, in the, in the press that uh, there are 70 bidders. Uh, I mean, are there really 70 bidders? I mean, uh, you know, you, uh, Shorenstein this year, uh, who's based in San Francisco, but you've been with them a number of years, uh, just recently purchased 125 Park Avenue. Mm -hmm. It's 125 Park, but it's really the corner of 42nd Street and Park. Exactly. Um, was it a beauty contest, as they would say? Were there that many bidders? Uh, real <laughs> bidders? Ask Woody. How I'm asking. He, 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 he marketed it. I think a lot of people uh, looked at it initially. Yeah. I think what happens is whenever there's... Did you look at it, Steve? Yes, we, we, we looked at it. And um, for a variety of reasons, we didn't pursue it aggressively. But I think what happens is in, uh, in Manhattan, whenever anything comes on the market, everybody takes a look. Mm -hmm. And I think buying real estate is really a function not, not only of interest rates and leveraging up, because I think that's a very dangerous game. And I think that uh, that's something that 
is great if you win and rents go up, but if things go the other way, you tend to lose your buildings. And I think over time, those that are modestly leveraged can weather storms, good times and bad times, which I think is really important. But I think to be a successful buyer, you really have to see something in a building that others don't. I mean, that's really the essence of it. It's really the rent roll, I would like to say. I think interest rates is obviously a big portion of it. But I think to really be the reason why different people buy different buildings is because I think different people see different things in buildings. And, you know, we're all not the same. It's not clear to everybody. Right. But, it, you know, looking at the portfolios, I mean, Vernardo Ver Ver owns 21 buildings. And, I mean, basically, uh, if you go into uh, Penn Plaza area, there's not any. There's one landlord. It's Fernando. Uh, you 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 go into uh, into Class A redevelopments. It's Tishman. Um, you go into um, unique neighborhoods. Value added, perhaps, would be you. You have Soho. Uh, I'm talking about Eric. Uh, Eric bought a property on 40th Street. When Brian Park wasn't that good, wasn't that really, you know, and then he put Catherine Gibbs. Then he, uh, I think his first property was uh, uh, the Godfather's uh, little <laughs> coffee club uh, downtown. Uh, Ravenite Social Club. Ravenite Social Club. I mean, okay. that's not in the portfolio of equity. <laughs> but, you know, there, 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 there are different types of properties, and each one has a different desire. Now, Shorenstein really was out of the market for years. Why did you come back into the New York market? You know what, in the last um, two years, we've bought four different properties here in New York, and we've really gravitated to New York because there is so much liquidity here. We feel that there's a real opportunity to create value and then ultimately get the, reap that value by exiting the market because there are a tremendous number of buyers. But in order to create that cash flow that Steve was talking about, there are a tremendous number of tenants. There's real depth to the leasing market. And so when we see an opportunity to create some value, you know, we try to capitalize on that um, and create that value and ultimately exit that. So we've really gravitated towards New York just because we think there's more value to be created and more liquidity in the market long term. Shelby? Uh, the reason we like New York is the liquidity, and we think this market, um, with several others in the, in the country, perform admirably in good times and bad times. So if the demand falls off, this market's going to be um, well constrained because of the supply risk is not great here. And then in the good times, if the economy comes back, you're going to see some nice rent spikes. Well, when we talk about New York, do we talk about Manhattan? Do we, uh, are we talking about different parts of Manhattan? You know, M Midtown Manhattan is the largest mm -hmm. office market mm -hmm. in the nation. Mm -hmm. Lower Manhattan is the number three right behind Chicago. That's correct. Um, that's a different market. Then, then there's something called Brooklyn, uh, which has an office market, um, a limited office market. And then you have Long Island City, which uh, Tishman Spire has made a commitment. Uh, and you're building a 14-story building right across the street from Citigroup's building. Uh, and then you have something across the river. They, they call it Jersey City uh, and Hoboken. What, 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 market are, what market do you like? We've always uh, invested in Midtown Manhattan because we think that that's the market where you have the most tenants. Tenants will, it's the biggest market, it's very diverse, um, and is basically a place where if you're successful and you get the building rented, you can exit at the highest, at the best cap rate probably in the country and maybe even in the world. You know, prior to, to, to the program, uh, David was saying rents. Um, what do you need for rent? You know, you buy a building. You know, it's a question of what what he said before. You know, giving the economics. You know, if if you if you pay a hundred million and you want a six percent, it's six percent on that. That's what your cap return is. If if you pay, let's say, four hundred thousand dollars, and what do you six percent on four hundred thousand? Is $24. Mm -hmm. So you need $24 to give you your return. And then you have... Let, let's make this easier. Do okay. We, do this on a per square foot basis. Fine. The reason we love New York is its size and scale. I mean, there is no city like New York. As you look at Midtown, 
the energy, the excitement of what goes on in the city every day. Um, we have, you know, I look at New York ultimately as Manhattan, 400 million square feet. Um, you know, I've used this statistic in the past. It's the size of the next eight cities combined, just to give you the scale of what this city is all about, the vibrancy, the excitement, which comes back to, you know, what we said earlier, the liquidity in this marketplace, the depth of the tenancy. You know, that's why, that's why we're all here. That's why we think this market uh, uh, is one that every day uh, more and more buyers want to be in. But now let's get back to, to the rent. You want to go back to the math? I want to go back to the math. I want to explain how somebody, uh, and uh, I'll bring it up. There is a property being sold on 417 Fifth Avenue. It is what we would say to our audience, it is not an A building that the people sitting over here own or operate. It is a B building or maybe a B minus building. The building is being sold for in excess of $400 a foot. You're not going to rent that building, like a Tishman Spire building or the Shorenstein 125 or 450 Lexington Avenue or Equity Offices property at 1301 or any of your other properties or even yours at 770 uh, Lexington Avenue. So let's talk about the math. Let's talk about the math. Okay. Then, you know, first of all, you're talking about that type of building today being sold at somewhere around $400 a foot with what are, I guess the most recent sales of class A buildings being in the 550 plus range? Mm -hmm. Yeah, five to six, five and a half to six. So uh, you can kind of you know, do the same math on either one of those, but let's stay with the $400 a foot. Um, the first thing you have to focus on is what kind of return you're looking on on your capital investment. But before you even get there, just to open the door. Can, can, I, can I interrupt? When we talk about your return, isn't that return sometimes based on who your investor is? I mean, you're, you're a public company. You have partnerships or investment mm -hmm. funds that you have <coughs> told them, and so do you, Right. okay, with a certain number. And you, when you go out to investors, you tell them. So that return, maybe you, you can... Everyone's going to have a different target right, for different their targeted, return expectations. Different right. target return and different time horizon. Some folks might be in it for a couple of years. Some might be in it for five to seven. Some might want to own it for generations. So you've got to weigh the return as well as the time well, period. Also, whether it's uh, leases roll over and, you ha and the risk level. And the risk it clearly is a business where the amount of risk you want to take relates to what kind of return you want to make. Right. It's, it's like so, when, you, when you bought 450 <coughs> Lexington Avenue, you had some major tenants in place. Sure. So, you know, you, you knew, I mean, you had a land lease situation, but you had some major tenants in place, so you knew what it was going to be. 417 Fifth Avenue, you have um, grade B tenants in the same category. Mm, not true. No? You've okay. got CIBC, which is a pretty decent credit, I think. At 417? Yeah. Yep. Okay, I apologize. So, you know, again, you're looking at kind of current returns and ultimately exiting and ultimately the releasing risk in terms of what the market's going to be like. So but let's, first let's get back to the economics. Okay. $24 is what Woody just said that we need for the return. No. To get. Well, at a 6% return. At a 6%. Okay. And a lot of have, people. A lot have of something. We have, I gotta, the I city has to pay you. real estate taxes. I've got to stop you. A lot of people are going to say, why would I do this for a 6%? We wouldn't do it for a 6% return. Mm -hmm. I don't but I think you have to bifurcate it. I think that you have to take your cost of debt and equity separately and not say six, because debt now on a long term basis could be five, five and a half interest only. Meaning you could walk you know, that would translate on a blended basis to maybe six and a half or seven initially on the equity. And and, and I would also argue that very few properties are trading today based on current returns. I think people must either have a plan or be prepared to sit there for a couple of years with virtually no return because very few opportunities offer an immediate return with no value added. Well, that and goes you're to saying the equity return when you say no equity return. Equity return. return. Pardon yeah. me. Yeah. Right. yeah. I mean, that goes to the fact that we're seeing, you know, the pricing of real estate sort of outpace sure. growth sure. In, in rental rates these days. And I also think rental rates uh, are, not, are not reflective of, of values at the moment. I think people are, have to anticipate rent growth. Yeah, but we, we, haven't we seen rental rates drop from, the, from 2000? Flat sure. or drop. Absolutely. High. Sure. I mean, in 2000, what were rents? <clears throat> Uh, it, it $70. Mm -hmm. And now? Same space, 55 
It's come, but it's but it used to be forty five. Right, right. It went so down it's come, in so it's coming, the end of 2001 and early 2002. It's coming back. It's really come back we're, in the we're last starting to six, see months, six months. Yeah. Yeah. Last six, six months, months is really we've begun to see some real vibrancy in the market. Right. And you see what's interesting is this is, this is a uh, business which is supply and demand, but the thing that's really great about New York is that it's very expensive to build new. Right. And so when you talk about prices of 400, 450, you really have to look at it in, in relationship to what it costs to build a new building if you can find a site. And when we talk about what's Manhattan, it's pretty hard to find any place to build in the key areas of, let's say, 3rd Avenue to 7th Avenue. It's been done already. So that's why you have to go other places. And even if you do build, because it's only the land differential, uh, given the fact that construction costs have risen dramatically, I mean, you're talking about $600 a foot at least to build a new building. So, so that's really you, your benchmark against which you are have Are you to saying that the cost to build a building today, <coughs> excluding land, is $600? No, no. Including, no. Including, including, land. Land. including land. Including, including land. land is 600 And he's also talking about office as opposed to residential. Right. Which in some cases is more expensive because land is traded for higher numbers. You know, the int if you want to go to residential, the thing that's really fascinating <laughs> about that not to get carried away, but but you can't find anymore in Manhattan a site where you can build a rental because the city's been so gentrified that every site that we would have thought was really more of a rental site is now being marketed as a condominium site. And so For prices the simple are, reason that nobody can afford based on the land prices to, to, to do right. a rental. Mm -hmm. right. That's right. And that driven by demand. People are willing to pay eight, nine hundred dollars a square foot to live on First Avenue. Four or five years ago, that would be unheard of. And now it's, you know, the norm. I shouldn't really say that. I'm trying to renew my lease. And <laughs> <laughs> <it's probably laughs> but that's why in this environment, I mean, I'd like to hear from everybody, it's excruciatingly difficult right now to buy stuff. I mean, as a value investor... But here's the guy who sells you this. Is it that difficult? I mean, or, 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 I mean these people couldn't buy from you? Well, everybody in the room looked at 125 Park Avenue. Gentry bought it. You asked before a number of bids. We had 36 meaningful bids on one asset. And of the 36 meaningful bids, probably 20 of the 36 were within close range to the final price. So that's 20 people were five assembled beyond myself and you in the room, 20 people that wanted to buy this building eagerly. Now, why is that? If there were 20 properties that were of similar interest in the market at the same time, wouldn't be a problem, but there isn't. There's only a few buildings at any one moment that are of interest to most of the buyers that we're chatting with. Location, location, location? Location, quality of building, size, scale, all these other issues that make them of interest. This particular building, I think, had one of the most appealing stories with respect to its upside or value-add potentials we've been discussing here today. So it had both a combination of very good existing and from current tenants, it was a very well-leased property, and a marvelous opportunity to add value in the near term. And hence, Gentry was willing to pay a price that reflected a modest initial return with the hope of mo fabulous returns in the future. But nevertheless, those returns are suppressed or the prices are increased by the fact that there's such a scarcity value in New York because so few buildings of merit trade at any one time. As well as I think that real estate, we've talked about it earlier, real estate is an accepted class of investment now. And so as the other investments have not performed admirably over the last several years, people are saying, hey, I can put money into real estate, I've got cheap financing, and I'm not going to get burned. That's a great point, Toby. I mean, I think it's really changed in the last decade. And it is its own accepted asset class today. And you know what? I actually had lunch today with a guy who now has seven billion dollars to mm. invest. Seven billion to invest in real estate. A lot of that money is going to be invested in the U.S. And he wants to put a lot of it in New York. So but, you know, here's another with investor. regard to that, uh, there are in the press and all the other media. It says that the the Germans, who were major major players, mm -hmm. uh, have have really quieted down. Right. Right. Uh, you know, and this year they bought uh, 1540 Paramount Port, uh, 15, 1540 Broadway. Broadway. And uh, then there was the recapitalization of 111 8th Avenue. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, okay. And, and, and well, Paramount's and a little then, bit unique. I mean, right. so many of the German buyers that we think of are syndicated buyers that are in that sort of 7 to 8 percent current return range that they sort of have to be in. They basically have to buy that cash flow, and I think that's why we've seen them quiet down. They're still around. I think they're still very active and looking, and Woody would know better than I. But, um, you know, they've not, we have not seen them 
be the buyers of a lot in New York this year. The last major German purchase was Two Park Avenue from David, and that was mm -hmm. a seven cap rate, seven percent return. Which is a building that today would trade at a six. five seven, five, five seven. eight, five mm -hmm. six. A four, four hour <coughs> audience. It traded about a year and a half ago. October of oh three. October of oh three. Uh, that building is on 33rd uh, between 32nd and 30 31 to 32 on Park Avenue. On Park Avenue, and it was owned for how long by the uh, Mendick? We actually bought this. This is the old Mendick company, which bought it back in 1985, and then it was contributed into uh, Vornado when we merged uh, the two companies in 1997. And. You sold it be, for the audience. You sold it for how much a foot at that time? Uh, 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 last hair, year, hair around three hundred dollars a foot, which today uh, we had talked about this earlier. Probably would trade somewhere close to four hundred dollars a foot. And, and you know, speaking about Rock Center, um, uh, Tishman Spire bought it originally in nineteen ninety six. Right. Uh, you put a lot <laughs> of money into redevelopment. You, you changed the the nature of the retail concourse and everything. Um, we, we spoke about how long the investor wants to keep the yield. Some buildings you've recently traded very quickly, like the one that you built at 222 East 41st Street. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Rock Center doesn't seem that you're planning to get rid of it right I now. I think you always have to look at your assets. Uh, Rock Center is an irreplaceable jewel. I mean, where do you find... Uh, Ten blocks in the middle of Midtown Manhattan, ever again. So that's a little different focus. But other buildings uh, we feel differently about, and if we can take advantage of the market and getting these type of prices where we don't think there's the amount of additional upside that we can create, we sell buildings. So just getting back to your initial analogy, I mean, you do everything with your assets depending on what they are. Okay. Let, let, let's try to you know, we, we spoke about. A little bit. Midtown, everybody loves. Big market. It's the best place. It's the number one market in the country, would you say? Without a question. Without a question. Let's go to uh, downtown. Uh, about 63 buildings, maybe 65 in the last couple of years, which were really B and C properties. And even some, I mean, 100 Maiden Lane, which sold this year, that wasn't really a, 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 a C property. It was a, the floor plates may have not been that good. Uh, Cadwallader property. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, these buildings have been taken off the market for approximately uh, about 11 million square feet um, because they were, what would you call them? That's the real health of the market. Uh, you know, Eric earlier was talking about everybody looking at real estate in terms of the reuse of assets. And whether that means we're looking at the Fuller building at the corner of uh, Madison and uh, 57th Street and looking at that building maybe five years from now as a potential residential conversion uh, for the tower of that asset and to really complement uh, the Four Seasons Hotel. Um, what's great about what's happened to downtown, the real health of the downtown market is the reuse of these assets. Taking these assets that effectively today are not efficient office buildings, don't work because of column spacing, because of ceiling heights, um, but bringing in residential apartments. The conversion of those buildings ultimately is what will require us to continue building space in New York. Uh, our stock in New York, as you look at it today, uh, between what has come out of the stock, that is office buildings being converted to residential, as well obviously as the disaster of September 11th, our stock today in New York really hasn't increased over about a quarter 20-year period of time, 15-year period of time. The last time we really, if you look at the stock of space in New York and you go back to about 1990, I'll tell you the stock today is at that same level or lower. There's not another city in the country that could say its stock effectively has remained flat over that 20-year period of time. But we lost 10 million square feet or 11 million square feet for conversion. We I, lost I, it's, I, think it's, I think it's more than that. I think okay. it's probably closer to 15 million square it's feet. Okay. So you're that, plus we lost 10 million square feet at the Trade Center. Right. So you lost 25 million square feet. Right. Mm -hmm. and, and Times Square, most of the properties uh, were built. I mean, the last one is being completed right now, I mean, with the exception of Bryan Park. And then you just built the small, how many square feet? It's small. 
<laughs> 1.4 million square feet as compared to 25 million that we took out of the stock. Huh. Mm. As, as well as the size of the market, right? What's the construction that you're doing to the size of the market? If you had a market that was 10 million square feet and you put 1 million foot on versus if you had a market that was 100 million square feet and you put 1 million square feet on it, it's the magnitude of that. You've got to balance the supply risk versus the demand risk. But now let's get back to downtown. 180 Maiden Lane was sold. Uh, today it was announced that 110 William Street is going under contract. Uh, Eric bought uh, with Joe Morney in 95 uh, Wall. Mm -hmm. um, one, equity, one uh, right. Equity is a major player, world largest office uh, owner of property. What have you been buying downtown, or what's your interest in downtown? And I'd like to address this to everyone sitting in this group, as opposed to me picking on Shelby. I'm not picking on Shelby. Sure. I'm just trying to. <laughs> don't worry. Oh, uh, you can pick on me. Uh, <laughs> For our One day, uh, Woody's going to become a developer. Yeah, that, that's the next step. How long is the show run? <laughs> <laughs> Depends. We're on our second season, you know. For downtown, Mike, I think uh, we like to be in markets, sub-markets that have good demand supply characteristics. So and you don't believe that the de demand characteristics are that great? I think though. demand's there. I think what we're concerned about now is a combination of what the returns are in the marketplace as well as the supply risk. You've got seven World Trade Center coming on over a million square feet, no pre-leasing. You've got the Freedom Tower coming on. You've got Goldman Sachs building their tower downtown. Um, you've got a lot of big users like J.P. Morgan putting back space. So you've got a lot of inherent supply risk in that market today. And for it to be compensated for those returns, um, for our time horizon, we don't think the risk return reward is there. So, uh, Gentry? You know what, we've looked a lot downtown. We've been a bridesmaid, never a bride, number of times downtown. Um, and we'll continue. You, you lost to those aggressive bidders? We did lose to some of those aggressive bidders in some cases. Um, and we will continue to look downtown. You know, we, th we believe in it long term. You know, it's a real market. It's a big market. It's got real tenants in it. Um, and so we'll continue to just look for the right opportunity. And clearly there's a risk-reward balance to what we're looking for there. But, you know, it's so fascinating looking at what's going on in the rents downtown right now. I mean, there's such a big division between downtown and midtown. And, you know, with Midtown tightening, we're optimistic that some of that demand will be driven downtown Would just you, by cost. You know, in past uh, shows, we said that downtown is the low-cost alternative. Mm -hmm. No doubt about it. Besides and you, the fact you still that, that it's City probably maybe $20 difference in rent. Sure. At oh, least, at least, at least 20, 20 At for least the, $20. For the, for the top quality space, more. And then in addition to the $20, you've got all these incentives. Yeah. See, see, our feeling is to be a player in downtown, you have to be more of a market timer because what you're talking about is right on. The fact that downtown is really good when there's a really good spread between downtown and midtown. Mm -hmm. But if mid it's a cyclical business, you know, as we've seen how the market changed suddenly in 2000, 2001, as the, mark, as the rents went down significantly in midtown, they obviously followed dramatically downtown. And Whereas in Midtown, I think you can hold and you don't have to be that perfect about when you exit something. I think downtown, it's more of a situation where rents can change dramatically if you're not, if you're not careful. And I think down, that's been the history of downtown going back to the Second World War, frankly, where downtown has always been very vulnerable to the Midtown market. And it's done very well relatively to itself or relative to itself when Midtown's done well, but now you've got New Jersey, the waterfront, which is a serious competitor, Long Island City, uh, uh, which is now being developed, and uh, obviously... Do you, th do you think besides, because b besides the, the large development that you're going to build, Tishman um, on the former parking lot and also uh, on the site against a cross street from uh, Citigroup. Do you think there are really going to be that many more office buildings downtown in Long Island City? Well, I think it's the next place uh, you've got to be. Brooklyn was the first place, and that's pretty well built out. And I think. Even uh, though they just approved plans for more office buildings in, in downtown Brooklyn. Yeah, but I think what you're really seeing in those markets is there's a real demand by corporations to have the best space, the right ceiling heights, the right column spacing all the things that you really want. And I think in new buildings in Midtown, you need $70, $80 a foot. You can get that same type of spacing 
that you need to run your business in a place like Long Island City for maybe a face rent of $40 a foot. And when you look at all the benefits that you get, employee credits, tax credits, things like that. Cut down the rent and maybe... Effective rent's maybe 25 How do you get to a $30 differential? I mean, compare that to Far West. <clears throat> you really think there's a $30 differential between uh, Long Island City and uh, Far West? Absolutely, because uh, your land cost is, is negligible, and you can build lower, you know, lower, you can get buildings built faster, and you can do it on a totally different basis. So you probably... You probably can build all in for where I said six hundred dollars a foot before. Four fifty, four hundred. Yeah, four hundred probably. And that obviously has a big impact and to a corporation who rents that space. Um, you know, there's so such significant benefits that the net rent is really much much less. And also, uh, that is a you know the city is really trying to, I think, create incentives to keep tenants in the in the city and make it really affordable for them. You know, I'd like to pose the question to the buyers here. Um, MedLife moved to Long Island City. That was the major, the large thing where they took the, the old uh, the brass property, which was uh, designated telecom. Right. Then the telecom business went out of business. And then they were fortunate that MedLife had a, an opportunity to see us first Boston. They took their space at uh, 11 Madison, and they got a great deal. There's no question. Let's say, hypothetically, the Browse family, who owns the property, would put that property up for sale today. Would the Shorenstein Company, would Equity Office, and do you think some of your customers <coughs> who, are, who always talk to you about trades would be that interested to buy this single asset because it's geared to a one corporation the way it's presently configured? Go into Long Island City? I, I say, generally speaking, yes. And for many of the reasons you just said, it's extremely difficult to buy in New York a single tenant, long term, effectively net leased building, where you believe you've got a good credit, a household name, which means it's marketable to the German funds who have not only want credit but want a household name because they have to do a retail syndication. And it's a So you mean in Germany, Met, met, met Life? Because of met the name. Life sells. Right, because of the name. Cisco it's system helpful. wouldn't. They may, they may not. But but, <laughs> but 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 having a household name is, in some cases, to some of the syndicators of equal or greater importance than the actual credit of the tenant, because it's a retail syndication. We, we know that those people that were written up in cranes, those uh, those active players, they they go anywhere. You just give them a property and they'll look at it. Insurance thing, one of your funds. Would you do it? We'd certainly look at it. We'd certainly look at it. At the end of the day, we're not always the best net leased building buyers. Let's, let's go a couple years. Let's say the lease, they, we didn't know what it was, okay? It didn't have such a net lease characteristic. Would you look at an office building in Long Island City? Or would you say it's the same thing as Jersey City? I, I'm trying to, you know, I'm just trying From to figure From our point of view, I think we are, our strategy is to build critical mass in key submarkets. And so we want to stay in that midtown submarket and not... Um, have one isolated building there. I think our strategy in terms of operating efficiencies on the expense side and on the revenue side, giving tenants options in a certain geographic area makes sense for us. And that's why you've seen us exiting non-core markets where we have one, two assets, because we want to be, for our, for our strategy, to be concentrated in the, what we think are the best sub-markets. And, and I think, I don't want to speak for Tishman, but since you're building everything else, you probably it would be part of a corporate campus would be a perfect well, I think what oh, makes God. that building attractive is that, assuming they would give you a long enough lease, let's say 15 years, in 15 years you can close your eyes and I think you'll see a whole different Long Island City, mm -hmm. which will make the re-renting of that building when, if, if and when MetLife were to exit at that time, a very attractive property. You know, I, I, I'd like to pose the question to David. What, what you people did, I mean, when you had that hole in the ground, where Alexander's was for years. Sure. And, and you've built, I mean, <clears throat> a magnificent complex. I mean, that's all you can say. With, with retail, with 1.4 million square feet of, of office and probably some of the best, the best uh, condominium apartments, greatest views in large properties with 105 apartments at Beacon. 
perhaps if you found the site in Long Island City, do you think you'd do a similar situation? Do you think you, you'd put retail down on the, on the ground floor, maybe some office upstairs because Long Island City, and then some condominiums or something on that? Steve wants to build in uh, Long Island City. I'd rather build on the far west. I still love the notion of what real agglomeration, what a city is all about. The ability to get there in you know rapid speed time, so I can have breakfast with Woody and I one can, one subway stop. You know it's great, it's great, but it's not <laughs> as good as taking a cab three blocks or walking across the street. Um, I think to me that's what makes New York City great. The traders who are going to be in that building who need uh, those large floor plates. Um, if you ask these guys. Where would they rather be? I think they clearly would rather be in Manhattan. Now, obviously, it's an issue of cost. Mm. They're always but isn't that the reason why Jersey City today, a lot of companies are not, you have, uh, Gentry told me she was in a building the other day in, in Jersey City, took her five floors to find some people working right. in the building. Right. Right. Yeah. Traders don't want to be in Jersey ask, City. Ask the <laughs> Goldman Sachs traders whether they want to be in New Jersey. The building is basically, at this point in time, you know, 50 plus percent of that building, that uh, Goldman's building, they're not even building out the space. You know, we, we're talking about repositioning of assets, you know, downtown repositioning, taking these, these properties and converting them to residential. You, you alluded to a very interesting fact that the Fuller Building, which is a class building, an old building, but a class building on 50, the corner of 57th and Madison, you know, on the top you could build apartments. Now. Uh, since I spend a lot of time walking in the streets to find out what's happening in development, on 57th Street today, there, east of your building, there are three residential towers being built. Uh, one on the former side of Crazy Eddie, uh, <laughs> you know, the, the two-story <laughs> Crazy Eddie Way site, directly across the street right. uh, on the former Sutton Movie Theater site. Right. Uh, and then if you go down to next to Mr. Um, the Chinese restaurant, um, Mr. Chow's, Mr. Chow's uh, there is a 18-story building. Uh, and it's like any piece of land. 57th Street is an unbelievable reposition. Um, my question, you're an office. You, your company, is Equity Residential? Separate company. Cha Sam's the chairman of both, but same, separate right. company. But <laughs> Equity, Equity Residential just probably paid the highest price for a... Uh, a residential tower in gotcha. Lower Manhattan. The, there's not a question. They paid over $500 a foot for 71 Broadway. Um, you're heavy into retail and you're heavy into repositioning. Do you see Shorenstein ever doing that? Or do you see Tishman doing that? Or, or you sure. We do it. You do? Sure. Well, Where? I think a uh, fuller building opportunity would be a great opportunity. In fact, we looked at it. And these guys beat us out. <laughs> so okay. it's a great opportunity. We Absolutely. thought the girl was prettier and we paid more for her. <laughs> no, 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 no. Now we're talking about the reposition. What David is saying, he's even repositioning the fuller to make it a residential on top. I'm no, not, I think that's a great opportunity because right. uh, prices have gone above $2,000 a foot, not necessarily on First Avenue or on Second Avenue. Madison Avenue is a different is a different market. I mean, it may be 57th Street, but it's I not. I mean, last week uh, I, I had Avenue. Jeff Blau on a panel, and he was saying to me that at Time Warner Center, uh, they've accomplished an average price of $2,500 a square mm -hmm. foot Remarkable. In, in the apartments. Uh, he said he's a little surprised. But for us now, just to come back to Steve's point, and Steve's doing the same, looking at any asset, to recognizing the valuations, recognizing the pricing in New York, you have to, as, you know, as Eric said, you have to have a vision of saying, okay, Bernie, uh, Steve rather, Steve Roth uh, you know, used to call me when Bernie and I first joined him a dumb office guy because I just thought in office terms. And the reality now is we're really looking at the buildings uh, in terms of how ultimately to maximize value. And while today in the top of the Fuller building, maybe I'm getting $60, $70 a foot for rent, um, after I take out my operating expenses, after I take out my taxes, that's <coughs> not going to compare to a valuation for residential condos on the top of that building of $2,500 a right. foot. Yeah. And, and, and if you relate that to, to Eric, who's bought property down in Soho, right. you know, you took property and 
What I think the do? key and the, the you know the common denominator here in this group is the fact that there's got to be a downside uh, use. There's got to be a fallback position, and there's got to be. You mean like putting a Catherine Gibbs in a building well, on 40th Street? Well, that was a risk, no question. But that was we we saw that as you know tantamount to waterfront property being on Bryant Park. We see as waterfront versus the rest of Midtown, so we have a unique competitive advantage. But as uh, Steve will tell you. Um, or as David will tell you, you know, you look even 95 Wall from our perspective is leased through 2010 to a triple A credit. Uh, we now have six years to think about alternatives that are better than the current use. Uh, and all the while, if we don't feel residential, which is the likely, you know, alternative use, makes sense either now or then, knowing that J.P. Morgan is looking to liquidate, then we're in the middle of the most active, dynamic uh, uh, office market in the country, probably. I mean, if you if you think it, if you if you think about it in those terms, with the bil many billions of dollars being funneled into downtown by the government, yeah. so something good, in my opinion, has to happen, and you don't have to wait because if something good happens now, or something good happens residentially in the Fuller Building, and you cross that graph mark, then you execute. Otherwise, you hold. A couple of comments have been made at seminars and other events recently. Uh, your colleague, uh, Jerry Spire, saying that uh, happy days are here again. Uh, Howard Rubenstein saying that uh, <coughs> there are no bad neighborhoods in Manhattan. Um, and I think the best one uh, could possibly be summed up by Norman Sterner of Murray Hope Properties when asked um, what goes up must come down. And uh, Norman's comment at the presentation and also to me personally was, uh, the only thing that comes, goes up and comes down is an airplane. Everything else goes up again. Tuition has gone up. That was Norman's comment. You know, uh, <laughs> that, that, that was his approach. Um, but, you know, some of your peers or colleagues, uh, there was this column on the 10 4 investors see trouble brewing. The record building prices will come back to haunt the industry. That's the word from a couple of investors who say the, re the record low cap rates and interest rate can't last forever. One even went so far as saying we're about to see some of the worst deals in the industry's history. Uh, Larry Wyman of HRO, uh, people are signing off on certain assumptions because they have, have capital to move. These assumptions are completely disconnected to the fundamentals of the assets in the history of the market. Manhattan is, isn't the, uh, Wyman isn't the only investor who sees trouble. Another uh, Manhattan expert said the Manhattan buildings sold a few years ago for a trophy price are suffering a cap rate involved slump in NOI. We're at historic lows in both interest rates and cap rates. But everyone is seeking alternatives to the stock market, and the reason that they can get five or six, that's good, but you can lose on hard assets. Do you agree with this guy? I mean, uh, is he right? Is he wrong? I mean, you know, it's somebody else's opinion. But, Mike, I think that you can look at any deal and say somebody paid too much. Break that into a couple different issues, right? A lot of it depends upon how the project's financed. As I think you said, Steve, you have to be more precise about your timing if you buy downtown than if you buy midtown. If you have short-term short floating rate financing, you have to be a little more precise about your timing. If you've got long-term fixed-rate financing, the example that you use for Long Island City, You've got a long time to see whether you made the right bet or the wrong bet. So I, the, my favorite quote was one <laughs> said by a competitor of mine who said to somebody who There are was, no competitors of yours, <laughs> Of course. Let's, let's remember that. One of my peers. There are no colleagues. competitors of all these people sitting here. But the quote was, you didn't pay too much, you just paid too soon. And I think that sums up a lot of the elements of our business because fundamentally we're talking about long-term assets and different views, as Shobi said, as to how long you want to hold them. So whether you paid too much is not just a function of what the rent is today and what the interest rate today is. It's what's your view toward owning it? Well, Quickly, we, we don't have too much time, but let's talk about views towards owning. You people own property, but Shorenstein last year uh, made an investment in owning debt on 350 uh, Madison Avenue and 14... 40 Broadway. 14 40 Broadway. Uh, Vornado... Uh, has two pieces of debt, uh, and it's in the public record, so we can talk about it, uh, on the GM <laughs> building, 
uh, one for two hundred million. You've read all of our public I've records. I've read all your public <laughs> records. Uh, at uh, LIBOR plus um, eight hundred and eighty-five uh, for the two hundred million dollars, and then you have the junior, the, the next piece, which it's LIBOR plus twelve hundred and eighty-five or thirteen hundred uh, things. Why did you buy these quickly? I, I, the boys are telling me that we don't have much time. We did you want to own to own? Did you buy the? To, did you like the returns, or did you buy them to own to uh, to own these? We've looked at a lot of mess to loan to own. Um, and our situation was just it was just great real estate, and it was great yield for great real estate. I mean, I got another vulture over here. He's just like <laughs> money. Uh, I don't want to call it a vulture. You're looking at an opportunity. Op all opportunities. It, it's all opportunity. Um, there will not be, in my opinion, uh, a situation where most owners of floating rate property that have recently acquired uh, deals that are thinly covering the debt, uh, an ability, if rates go up even slightly, to carry these properties over time. I think there's going to be, there's no question in my mind, there'll be a major, major correction with uh, regard to people that the good okay. news is, the good news really is there's a lot of capital in this room. I, right. a lot of capital. <laughs> I won't be able to capitalize on those opportunities. I'd like to thank everyone for being here. Woody Heller, Gentry Hoyt, Shobi Khan, David Greenbaum, Steve Wexler, and last but not least, Eric Adar. See you next month when we go to Westchester. Thank you all for being here. Thank you, Mike. Good night. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Bye -bye. Funding for the Stola Report is made possible by a grant from the First American Title Insurance Company of New York. The First American Corporation is the nation's leading diversified provider of business information products and services that impact the major events of people's lives.